Walt Disney's Disneyland. When you wish on a star, makes no difference who you are. Each week as you enter this timeless land, one of these many worlds will open to you. Tomorrowland, promise of things to come. Fantasyland, the happiest kingdom of them all. Frontierland, tall tales and true from the legendary past. Adventureland, the wonder world of nature's own realm. Presenting this week from Adventureland, a Mediterranean cruise. Desert guy. And here he is, Ludwig of Arabia. Salam, oh my friend. Your servant will conduct you safely across the yellow sands to the black tents of the blue men of Morocco. Oh, what a color spectacle that must be. And now your host, Walt Disney. You know, it's true that the world actually does seem to be getting smaller and smaller and smaller. <laughs> oh, let's go over do it now. You know, it took Christopher Columbus about two months to cross the Atlantic Ocean and probably a couple of years to get ready for the trip. But with today's rapid transportation, crossing the ocean is just a four-hour ride to get someplace where you can start traveling. And you don't have to bother with the details of getting ready. You can relax now. This is the age of the package deal. Even business trips and vacations come all wrapped up and ready to go. The people who specialize in these package tours are called travel agents. They arrange for transportation, reservation, stopovers, connections, and what have you. Then they deliver the works all in one neat little bundle. Now, as a rule, I don't believe in giving free plugs on this program. But the man who handles my travel problems does a really outstanding job. And he has a special deal on this week, a hot buy on a Mediterranean cruise. So we're going to let him tell you about it. And here he is, our traveling salesman, Professor Ludwig Globetrotter von Drake. Now, I know the first question you're going to ask is, why a Mediterranean cruise? Hmm? Well, it's where our civilization and our culture came from. But culture, schmelcher, this is the place where you can have the most fun. <laughs> now, be ready for our cruise. And our first stop is, naturally, the bank. <laughs> you know, you got to turn your savings into foreign exchange. Now, this is a British pound. This is an Italian lira. And this is a French bank. Ooh. Ooh, that's very tasty. Anyway, the big problem is how to travel as light as possible. Now, for that, we have the two suda. A marvelous invention. Now, the first suit is simple. Now, the second is a little harder. Ooh, especially if you're wearing it. Now, we zip it up. And pop the daisy on the scale. What? 40 pounds overweight? Of course, it's me. Well, that proves that travel is broadening, especially around the equator. <laughs> and now we are ready to board our ship. That is the SS Vaughan Drake. And we are going to meet our captain. Guess who? That's I'm. All right. Now, the first thing a captain does is he shoots the star. You got to be careful because they might shoot back. Well, anyway, what we do is we plot our course. And now we are ready for departure. So, all aboard that is going aboard. And the good ship Van Drake is on her way. Bon voyage, bon voyage. Have a gay holiday and don't forget to write Bon voyage. Au revoir. Taking all of the sights and all the lot of sights, dancing into rings, 
holding hands in Rome, kissing in the Colosseum twice as nice as home. Live it up. Do it all. Happy trip. Have a pay. We are off course. Pull the red out, Kurt. The red course, man, you book it. Wrap the anchor. Look out. Oh, my ship went down without its captain. <laughs> I broke the honor code of the sea. <laughs> this means summary court martial. Something screwy going on around here. Well, what do you know? We are in Portugal. Oh, what luck. It's three the time. And you know what that means? It means the bulls are taking over the town. On the way to the arena, they send some of the bulls down the side streets for the amusement of the residents. It's a wonderful chance for the amateur Torero to find out if he's got the stuff to be a real pro. The rescuers will. It's up to his friends to attract the bull's attention. If they can get him to charge in another direction, the bull's victim can be rescued. In these contests, odds of 100 to 1 is considered safe. People to bulls, that is. But when the odds is 100 to 2, well, the people's retreat to safer position. But it's here in the bullring that the big league Portuguese fighting bulls can really strap their stuff. This is the Querida Grande in Lisbon, with Forcados Magnifico, Toreros with Bravado, Campinos from the Ranchos, and heroic Caballeros, all to do battle with El Toro. That the bull, El Toro. But El Toro has all the advantages here, because here in Portugal, they never kill the bull. They never even throw the bull. They just humiliate them. <laughs> You 
you'd think this was a World Series going on the way they're carrying on here. A champion Terrell is the idol of the public. He's the Joe DiMaggio of the bull game. The Matador first demonstrates the more conventional style, just to prove that he can do it. For this routine stuff, the Matador sword is concealed beneath his cape. But for the climax, he throws the sword away. Unarmed and defenseless, he stands before the enraged bull. So, what does he do? He just touches the spot marked X. And the frustrated bull is led away to fight again another day. But wait till you see the main event. This features the famous Furcados, the bravest of the brave. One of the Furcados offers a talisman to a pretty girl as a token of luck. And believe me, these kids is gonna need all the luck that they can get. Now, armed only with their bare hands, these nuts is gonna try to throw the bull. And who is the bull's first victim? Old Lucky for Kadosh himself. This kid ought to ask for his good luck charm back, cause it's not working. If you want to immobilize the bull, the trick is to make personal contact. the national sport of Portugal. It's called Touch Bull. Any volunteer? All right. Now we continue our trip right through the streets of Gibraltar here. And boy, that's gonna be a tight squeeze, I tell you. Now these famous streets are dominated by the mighty rock of Gibraltar. The symbol of strength and permanence. And as long as it stands, we are safe. Oops. I hope it was insured. Anyhow, maybe they better change the name of the place to Pebble Beach or something. But the main thing is that we made it. And we are steaming to the sunny shores of La Bella Italia. Which brings us to a very important subject in travel. The language barrier. That's where a good phrase book comes in handy. Now let's say, for instance, did you want to ask a young lady, where is the nearest pizza parlor? All right, then we look it up in here, and it says, Perdoni la bella signorina, me quale non ce la meta fate que tutta la pizza? <laughs> well, we better not ask questions in broken Italian, or we're going to get a broken jaw. That's what we're going to get. But never mind about the language barrier. In Italy, what we worry about is the sound barrier. Of course, here, people is communicating with sound and music. Now let's ask the same question, but in the right way. Perdone, signore, where is the nearest pizza parlor? See, it works. That's the way they talk around here. And the professor can prove this. So now we anchor here in sunny Sicily and see how the natives do their shopping at the local supermarket. Aiutavo mercato a cacciare un furticino. Un furticino. Aiutavo mercato a cacciare la gazzina. Ma la gazzina. Aiuta 
of this cruise, I've made reservations for you to see an outdoor ballet that had the longest run in show business. It's playing up here in Venice, where everything is on water, even the freeways. The play is called The Blonde and the Gondolier. And you know how long it's been running? 300 years. No wonder. Ooh, wait until you see that blonde. Ooh. This is the troupe and they are riding into town to advertise the show because everybody knows that publicity is the soul of show business. 
Imagine trying to get new customers for a show that's been running for 300 years. As you can see, they are making sure that everybody gets the message. And the message is, curtain time, 8.30 sharp. Place, Commedia dell'arte e Theater. And the title of the show, La Biondina e il Gondoliari. And if you paid attention, you know what that means, because I already told you once. And here are the stars. The blonde is the one in the front seat, in case you're wondering. And this back seat driver is the gondolier. He thinks his passenger is pretty cute, and she thinks so too. Anybody in the streets of Venice can tell you the story. Come to think of it, I don't see any streets. So maybe I better tell it to you in my own inimitable, inim in my own way. You see, the gondolier only drives this water taxi in his spare time. He's also a clown in the ballet. And he would like to take Blondie to the show so that she can see how important he is. But first, he's got to get acquainted with her. And I think she's going to see to that. Meanwhile, back at the troupe, they are trying to drum up business. That's an expression that originated right here in Venice. pretty good. So our hero decides that now is the time to reveal his double role. So they are off to the theater. Ooh, what a sneaky way to get a customer. Well, it's almost curtain time. And the suckers, uh, I mean, the audience, is in place. And as soon as our clown gets Blondie to join them, he's going to ditch her and frolic with two of the cuties in the cast. Now, if this confuses you, you isn't alone. Just think of what it's doing to me, because I am the one that is trying to explain the whole thing. is too much for our hero's pickle heart, and he passes out of the picture. She's calling for a doctor, but instead she gets another clown with a little more life in him. Even Blondie could go for this substitute, but he too wants to play ball with a ballerina. <laughs> Just in the knick of time, Dr. Kildare and his nurse Friday, 300 years before his time. Hmm, and you thought that we was the ones that invented Wonder Drug. As you can see, that stuff's got a real wallop. I'll bet you didn't know that the classic barroom brawl was this old, did you? Yes, they got a sheriff in the plot, and that's lucky, before somebody gets hurt. And there's even a femme fatale to spring the boys from the hands of the law. And so, like all plays does, it ends happily. At least until the next episode. But for that, we got to come back in another 300 years. See you then. And now to go forward on our cruise. We have to go backwards. That's right, backwards in time. 
because here along the South Mediterranean, they got ancient tribes living just like they did 2,000 years ago, in Sarah's Desert. But if we don't want to get lost in this big sand lot, we better hire an experienced desert guide. And here he is, Ludwig of Arabia. Salam, oh my friend. Your servant will conduct you safely across the yellow sands to the black tents of the blue men of Morocco. Oh, what a color spectacle that must be. You know why they are called the blue men? That's because they dye their robe and the blue rubs off on their skin. Now, do you believe that? Well, I don't believe it, because that's a lot of unscientific nonsense. That's what it is. Now, they live in here someplace. And as far as this printing is concerned, don't go looking for it over there, because it's only on the map here. And what a map this used to be. This was the heart and the brains of the whole ancient world. On these shores was mighty Carthage, the grandeur of Rome, beautiful Greece, and here the wonders of Egypt. But today, all that remains of these classic empires is just a bunch of rocks and ruins. All around the rim of the Mediterranean basin, you can see the evidence of these great cultures. Just imagine carving up all these columns by hand and standing them up without the helps of cranes and bulldozers. And here is where they threw the discus and fed the lions at about 2000 Fahrenheit, no, BC that is. And this is one of the first skyscrapers ever built. Yes, sir, these old guys knew a thing or two. Look at this temple in the ancient city of Palmyra, carved in one piece out of the solid mountain. It's sort of an ancient Mount Rushmore. <laughs> well, time and wind and medieval termites has messed up all the wonderful work. And the people that planned and built it has vanished away and can only be found in history books. But over here in Morocco, in the shadow of the Atlas Mountains, is Marrakesh, the capital and gateway to the Sahara Desert, a city that's not so cultural, but it's livelier, and it's been jumping for over 2,000 years. And on the sands of that desert lives the blue men I told you about. And they've been living in the same primitive way in this land of ancient culture ever since Marrakesh was only a whistle stop for camels. Once a year, they have to go to town for groceries, some new duds, and to freshen up. So they launch their ships of the desert and head for the big city. Well, after a couple of weeks, you get pretty tired of sand in your soup. But then suddenly, a Miraji. No, it's Marrakesh. This is the great marketplace. It's sort of a combination supermarket, midway, and bazaar, all in one. This is the quick lunch counter, where our blue friends can order the blue plate special, fried grasshoppers. Barber shops haven't changed in 2,000 years either. Here you can get a shave and a haircut, and all in one place, too. And barbers haven't changed either. He's been yakking all that time, <laughs> non-stop. Meanwhile, you may ask, where are the blue ladies? Well, where do you expect? <laughs> At the beauty saloon, Salon. This season, the popular fashion is a henna treatment, but not for the hair, for the hands. Designs like these bring good fortune. This way, they always got lady luck right in the palm of their hands. They got plenty of time for the latest hairstyles while they're waiting for the laundry to get done, which they left in the syncopated laundromats. And of course, our blue men visit the hot spots.
Your captain is scanning the horizon for our next port of call. Let's see. Ah, there it is. Oh, it's my lunch. <laughs> How appropriate, because that's just where we are going. An island where they're packed in like sardines. In fact, that's why it's called Sardinia. And the funny thing is that they don't even like sardines. What they are really nuts about is tuna. As you will see when we go out with the fishermen to catch the world's largest sardine. Their leader is called the Reis. You wouldn't think these nets is strong enough to hold even an emaciated herring. Well, you're right. You see, tunas is like sheep. They follow the leader. So these nets makes a passageway to an underwater corral which is stronger and which has no exit. When all is ready, the big rope is laid out so they can attach the nets to it. in place, it stretches out two miles from the shore. And now they can start laying out the nets. This course marks the entrance to the tuna corral. The hardest part is just sitting and waiting to see if the tuna is taking that tricky freeway down there. There's one. They're tossing out lures to bring the fish up to the top. Well, looks like the grail is full of tuna, so now it's time to close the gate. They make a square around the fish trap. And after a little prayer, the rise gives the go sign to begin raising the nets. On his oar, it's the signal to start gaffing. Believe me, this job is no kid's play, especially for the guys up front. They gotta know how to toss the tuna into the boat and then duck quickly over the rail, or else that powerful whiplash from the tuna's tail could break an arm or maybe even a back. and here's one of them, weighs almost half a ton. How did they get him in that small can? Sometimes the plunge forward is too enthusiastic, and if this guy doesn't get out in a hurry, he's gonna be in for some real trouble. The 
big day is over and our Sardinian tuna fishers can make their run for home with light hearts and a heavy cargo. I think maybe you'll agree with the professor that these hard-working boys have earned a little holiday. And like all hard-working Isaac Bolton, they can hardly wait to show off their catch to their wives. Then, of course, the catch is canned. Otherwise, how would so many of you ladies be able to order that dainty tuna salad sandwich for your lunches? We're getting off because now we have come to the real fun part of our cruise. Souvenir hunting. Now, all over the Mediterranean, they got what they call flea markets where you can buy almost anything you want. Anyway, you are always sure to come away with something. Ooh. You know, people pick up a lot of precious mementos, such works of art as fancy chapeaus, native jewelry, hand-painted old masters, genuine brand new antique paperweights, and vases, or is it warm? Well, whatever it is, when it's empty, it is really a musical instrument, see? Well, this is definitely not a musical instrument, but who cares? It's a wonderful vintage. Now, in this part of Sicily here, they call this clay tuba a quartar, and they play it at the festival of the decorated horse car. And the overture has already begun. winner of a Luigi. That's the Sicilian Oscar for the best horse card of the year. Every card deserves a prize. Every horse is wearing his fanciest bonnet. I guess this one just couldn't make up his mind. His horse is saluting the cup. And here is the cup. And so the triumphant winner returns home to crow about his victim. Ah, <laughs> 
the end of our Mediterranean cruise draws near. Bon voyage, bon voyage. Lived it up, had a ball. And now it's time to say, bon voyage, bon voyage, bon voyage.